Okay, first questions. How many of you guys are not uh, confident in listening to a session uh, in Italian language? Raise your hand. One. Okay, but I will maintain the session in English for you. <laughs> Feel a little bit spe special. Okay, uh, hi all and uh, okay. Uh, so we are we are going to talk about uh, how to create an Android application using uh, obviously Android and some cloud cloud technology that can greatly speed up your development. My name is uh, Alfredo Morresi, I work for Google, I'm Developer Relations Program Manager for Italy, so basically I, ca I take care about uh, developers in Google technology in the Italian context. Uh, and you can reach me in uh, these addresses, so my email, uh, my Plus profile and my Twitter account. So if you want to take a look uh, to the application that you are going to create now, you can simply scan this QR code right now and then have a really real overview of the application, because it's the application we are going to create. Five, four, three, two, one, okay, go. So, uh, it's a chat application, you can have a kind of public chat between all the people that have installed the application, you receive push notification, you have to be authenticated in order to use the application and other stuff. And we can do all of that in less than 40 minutes, okay? So, how we can do that? Basically, we have two components in this kind of application, a mobile client and a back-end part. You can use a variety of different technology to implement, to implement the back-end part. In this session, I will talk about the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, quick questions, how many of you know the Google Cloud Platform? So, for example, App Engine, raise your hand. Compute Engine, raise your hand different kind of storages that Google provides, also the same person, then BigQuery and Cloud Endpoints services. Okay, super brief introduction. Mm, Google Cloud Platform is the Google vision about cloud, and uh, it's composed by different, uh, uh, we can call it uh, pieces. Uh, you can use uh, them together, or you can combine them with uh, third-part services, or you can include them inside third-part services. So it's very, very open application that you can use really as you as you need. There are uh, three main parts: the compute parts, so about uh, App Engine, so platform as a service. You only deploy your code, and Google will take care of all the rest. The compute engine, so basically virtual machine that you can use to create your software stack. Then there is storage, file, SQL, and NoSQL storage. And then there are services built on top of all the other stuff, okay? So for the application, we are going to use uh, App Engine, okay, in order to basically the backend logic. We are, are, we are going to use Cloud Endpoints, so we will create uh, APIs between the backend and our application, and a little bit of cloud data store to store those data. Uh, I can talk uh, on how to create the backend, but basically I can say forget about the backend. There is uh, an implementation already ready on the internet, it's called Mobile Backend Starter, and is a kind of wizard that you can use to create, automatically create your, back your backend and all the client code that you need. So, if you search for uh, mobile backend start, uh, you, will, you will arrive to this uh, screen and then uh, step by step you can follow the procedure. Uh, why use the mobile backend starter? Basically, there are different reasons. First one, uh, as, you s as I told you, you don't need to code actually the backend. It's already ready for you. Uh, it works. It works also pretty well. And it has libraries for Android, iOS, and uh, even web application, so it's really, really open. Uh, you have the native support for push notification, so when someone sends a new chat message, all the other devices subscribed to the chat receive a notification that something is changed. You, uh, the mobile backend starter has implemented authorization and authentication. Uh, I will talk about that later. And basically, the application can work with one, two, ten people, 
10,000, 1 million of people. So you don't need to change a single line of code in order to scale to the dimension that you reach. Basically, and also because basically it's everything free, so you don't uh, even put uh, any single credit card to start using the, all the infrastructure, okay? So this is the address of uh, mobile backend starter. You can uh, go and try it now. Step by step, you create a new cloud project, new, new Google Cloud Platform project. It's a standard procedure in order to, using, to start using the Google Cloud Platform. When you create a project, you, you, can, you can define a project name, and you can put here whatever you want, and a project ID. This project ID is very important, so, take, uh, so remember it, and it has to be unique in all the Google Cloud Platform. Then, once you have created uh, the application, a kind of wizard appears telling you that you can start using the cloud project or you can install two, basically, uh, two test application or sample application. The first one is the one that are interesting for us, and it's called Mobile Backend Starter. The other one, it's a PhotoFeed Java sample application. It's a kind of uh, PhotoFeed application, so you can also take a look to other uh, stuff, to other features of the cloud platform installing the second application. Uh, you deploy this application directly inside your brandly new, brand, <laughs> brandly new created uh, project, and then you can download the source of the Android application and basically configure a couple of parameters and it's done. Everything works. So you have to configure these three parameters in order to have uh, the working application, and you can start using this, the app on Android, iOS, and web, as I told you. Magic, absolutely no magic, is just something configured for you by the wizard. Let's go and explore what the wizard basically do. First step, we need to access to the API. We generally you have your backend, you have your data, and then you, you need a way to open this data to the outside world. Okay? Mm, you can create a particular protocol in order to communicate with your backend, or you can use RESTful API, for example. It's pretty much common and open standard. So let's go with RESTful API. There are different libraries that you can use to create your RESTful infrastructure, or you can also code it by hand, call after call. Google, Google Cloud Platform offers the Google Cloud endpoints. So it's a very, very easy way to generate RESTful APIs basically using annotations on your Java or Python code. Okay? Uh, this is a kind of functional diagram. You have your backend here made in App Engine. Then you create you use Cloud Endpoints and Cloud Endpoints generates automatically all the code here to create RESTful APIs and all the code here, here and here to access to those API. So it's not only create something server side, but is all is also create something client side for a different kind of clients. Uh, in addition, when you use Cloud Endpoints, you can also explore the API that you have created using the standard Google API Explorer. I don't know if you guys know this uh, website, this service, but it's the standard one that you can use to access to the wide variety of Google APIs. And so uh, you can basically use it to also explore your API. So if you are creating API that need to be used by another people, another uh, company, another service, you, can, you don't need to create uh, fancy stuff to uh, show them your API. You can simply say, okay, point your browser to, the, to this address and you, we will be able to see my API, to interact with them, to make test calls, and stuff like that, okay? And this is totally for free. So, once uh, we have created our uh, cloud project, uh, once we have said, okay, I want to deploy mobile backend starter, we need to connect to the brandly new created website, and uh, then we will see the real address of the website where you can connect. Select open, okay, as authentication, as a authentication and authorization method. So basically, for this first step, no authorization, no authentication. Then you remember the project ID of the project we have created. 
this one is the one that I've used in the example, take it and put, sorry, in the project ID file, okay, as a constant. Then you can run your application and basically it's work. <coughs> Okay, very easy, uh, I don't know, less than five minutes, maybe the time to wait uh, for the deployment of the application in the cloud console. Very, very easy. So, uh, I will show you some code then, because we have additional time, we can also open the IDE and see how this code really works and how it's inserted in the project. But basically, it's very easy to access to the RESTful API that you have created. How? Uh, when you generate, using Cloud Endpoints, the APIs, okay, you also have a library, uh, also a library is generated, and this library should be included inside your Android project, okay? Once you have included this library, you can simply create a new mobile backend, it's the basic object created by the library, uh, specifying a couple of parameters here, so the HTTP, HTTP transportation layer, uh, a JSON uh, serialization and deserialization object, and a third parameter that uh, we will explore later. And then you should set the URL of your cloud projects, okay? Once you have done that, basically you can create, you can call one of your API with a very simple line of code, okay? You have uh, the version of the API, because you can declare different versions in the same project. So, for example, you can have a version 1, then you can start working on version 2, and both of them can live together in the same project. You have the name of the API method, okay, in this case insert, and then some parameters. The super nice part is that if you change, for example, the name of the RESTful API, also the new, the, the new code that is generated that is generated after this change will reflect the change of the name. So this call will give you an error, okay? When you not are uh, running execution time, but when you are creating, when you are writing your application, as soon as you change the old library with a new one, this code gives you an error. And for me, it's super good because I don't want to l basically lose my time searching, oh, where is the string where I put the name of the method to call and stuff like that. Basically, you have uh, <laughs> creation time, you have an error and you solve it and you are okay. Uh, here, basically, you create a cloud entity, and the cloud entity is the object of my my application domain. Uh, mm, domain, so uh, can be everything really. Then, from this here, this method here, translate this object of the, my application uh, domain to the object th that is understood by the API, and then I put this object in the insert call, okay? It's a little bit weird, but we can uh, take a look then after with the real code. Or, and then, once you have, uh, the, once you have executed uh, this call, you can basically retranslate from this uh, resu result CO the object back, okay? Okay, now I can access, access to my API, my backend, but I also want to add Authorization, authorization and authentication. So, what's authentication? Basically, uh, authentication is the fact that uh, as a user, I want uh, that I want that uh, uh, I don't know my chat, my chat messages are recorded using my users. Okay, so an anonymous user basically cannot enter in the chat. With authorization, uh, I mean. I want that only this particular application can access to my API. So it's not open to the whole web, it's open also uh, only to a particular application or a particular set of applications. And this is, this is maybe, this is good because you don't uh, need to write a logic to check who is accessing the API. You can simply say, okay, uh, these API are available for all, or for example, if you are developing for third party services, you can say you, you and you have access to my API. So you can check everything and only you can do that. I don't uh, need to care about the external world that arrive, try to attack me and stuff like that, because the Google Cloud uh, infrastructure will manage everything for you, okay? So, first one. 
we need two parameters in order to set uh, authorization and authentication. So remember, authentication is uh, my, my user, authorization is only this app or these sets of applications. Android client ID, and uh, obviously this can be, this is used for authorization because it's basically a, a hash made by the name the package name of your application and the another uh, the SHA key that you you that you have used to sign your application so it's 100% unique of your application there is no way that someone else can use the same hash basically outside of you. Obviously, if you lose your key or you put it on online, for example, it's a problem. But if you keep uh, your key secrets, this hash can only be yours. Then we also need a web client ID because, you know, uh, cloud endpoints manage also OAuth2 authorization mechanism. And so we, we have to say, uh, don't ask to the user the authorization to access to his data. Of, from this application that basically is this is uh, has the same author of the server so i'm the author of the server i'm the author of the application it's no sense that i can, that i ask the user do you allow that this application can access to the data created by the same author <laughs> of the server and so using the web client id you basically bypass in a good way obviously the auth authentication flow by the way everything is documented here how to get uh, these two important uh, parameters? Basically, you go, you go back to the Cloud Console, you go here on the credential, create new client ID, and you select installed application, you select Android, and here you put the, 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 basically the fingerprint of your certification. If you don't know how to generate it, don't worry, because here you have all the instructions step by step to generate this fingerprint, okay? Then, you, once you have done that, you obtain this very, very long client ID. And this is the first parameter that we need. Second parameter, Again, go to credential, go to create a new client ID, this time for a web application, and you have done. You obtain the second client ID. Put these two Android client ID and web client ID in our backend. So there is uh, two fields, you remember. We set uh, before, we stopped the open because we want that the API uh, could be accessed by everyone. And now we set uh, secured by client id and we put these two keys here then you set this parameter in the const file inside the android application you set this parameter inside the const file of the android application and again you have done now you have an api that is accessible only by your application and you have to be logged in order to work with this api Okay, you can implement uh, generally, okay, when we are talking about, uh, if we talk about uh, authentication, you can build your authentication system. You can use your users, you can do whatever you want, but obviously, if you do that, you also need to, get, you, you also need to, to take care about security of your system, reliability of the system, and a lot of other stuff. With Google Cloud Endpoints, you can use the Gmail account of people as authentication token, okay? So if the user has a Gmail account, as a Google account, and generally when he owns an Android phone, he has, you can use the same authentication in order to access to the chat program. How to do that? Android expose a kind, some, some services that can be used to ask to the user what account could be used by your application without the need of reinserting the password and all the other stuff. Basically, if the user has the account inside the phone, you can say, okay, I think that you have seen this dialogue before. What account do you want, basically, to use with my app? The user pick up one of them. Basic, generally, there is, only, there is only one account, maybe two, three more. It depends on the user. And then this account is returned inside your application. Only the account, no password, no other additional data, only the account name. And this is what we need in order to log to the RESTful APIs, okay? 
So, and this is the code. You basically here, it's a standard piece of code. If you search for how to use Google account credential, you will find plenty of these examples. And if, the active is the, is, if there is a selected account, you can uh, skip and go. If there isn't, you can simply open. Okay, this is Start Activity for Result, is standard Android code to open something, to open some system activity in this case. And this dialog appears, the user pick up one of the account, and then the account is returned to the application. Generally here you store the account somewhere, so you don't need to ask for <laughs> the user account every time the application restarts. And then you go back to the creation of our, you remember, HTTP request, uh, the creation of our cloud endpoint service. You create a new object called HTTP request initializer, and inside of it you put the credential of, you put only the username of the user, so not the entire credential, like password and stuff like that. And then, when you create the mobile backend, this time, instead of null, you add this parameter here, the HTTP request initializer, okay? Doing that, okay, you reset the same URL, doing that, automatically, the application connect to the web services, passing the user that want to send the chat message, and so inside your application, inside your backend application, you can trace this user. And if another application try to access to your RESTful API, the other application basically is kicked off. No way. Okay? So it's in this case we have implemented authentication, authorization in five different steps. Okay. Step three. I want to be, I, it's a chat uh, service, so uh, when someone writes something new in the chat, I want to be, I, I want to know, basically. I want to have this new message displayed on my phone. How can I do that? There are different ways, and uh, I would like to know if some one of you can suggest one of the ways. For the bravest, I have one small gadget. Ta -da! So, suggest me different methods uh, in order that I can use to have this kind of dialogue between uh, server and client. Push notification. Why? Hmm? Okay. Basically, it's correct. You have different ways. Generally, there are two different approaches. The first one is polling, and so you, from mobile client, you check the server asking, there is something new, there is something new, there is something new, a part of being a little bit boring, but uh, you, you basically you consume a lot of battery in the client, and if you ask every, for example, every minutes, every message that arrives inside this minute time frame is not received from your client, okay? It's not received by your client, okay? So, there is another method called push notification, so every time something up happens on server, the server notifies all the connected client about uh, the new event. Not, uh, you choose what to say to the clients, but basically the server say, okay, something is happened, then it's up to you, for example, to update yourself or to totally discard this information and stuff like that. Google and Android has its own uh, push notification system called the Google Cloud Messaging for Android. Uh, now we have the version 2 of this protocol, and in version 1, uh, the only thing that you can do was just simply send a message from the server to the client saying to the client, okay, something is happening. Now, with version, with, with version 2, you can also send messages back from client to the server. Why? Because, I don't know, uh, if you have one phone and, the, and one tablet, and you receive a new notification, uh, and you receive a notification for a new mail arrived, okay? Basically, you receive the notification both on client and on tablet. You read the email on one of your devices, and the notification on the other device disappears. Why? Because they are using this kind of new push notification service. So, 
the client in uh, where you read your email send a message to the server saying okay i've read this email then the server say okay i need to alert all the other client uh, telling them that uh, the notification have to disappear okay using this uh, flow you can basically bore the user just one time in one device okay uh, how to insert the push notification inside this chat app? Also in this case, it's very straightforward. You go, to the, you go back to your cloud project, you enable this API. It's a standard way of using Google API, so maybe new for you, but it's to something totally normal for someone that are using the Google APIs. You enable the Google Cloud Messaging for Android APIs. You create a new server key in order to track the usage of these APIs. And uh, basically, you click here, here, and here, so three click. You get an API, an API key for your project, and you insert this API key inside your backend. Okay? Once you have done that, you can, uh, okay, you enable the push notification. Okay, here you can see also the space to enable push notification for iOS. So there is, you can follow the flow, uh, mm, the flow for iOS to enable push notification, and you can add here the certificate and stuff like that. Doing that, then you, uh, you need to add the project number to your Android application. You copy this value here and uh, once again you have done no magic uh, simply code okay what kind of code very easy uh, when your device starts uh, he it's he needs to say to the server okay please register me for new notification okay i'm here i'm exist if someone happens please tell me okay and how to do that basically you you have to create a regist registration id so you have uh, a registration ID stored in your application. It's up to you to decide how to store. Generally, people use shared preferences or other way. And uh, if uh, this uh, registration ID is not present, because, for example, it's the first start of your application, you simply call this method here. And this method uh, executes a call to the server asking for a new registration ID uh, with all the data of the client and the, the data of also of the project ID. And a new registration ID is returned. Then you can store it in the way you like inside your app. Then the standard way to receive a push notification in Android basically is to implement a broadcast receiver registered on a particular kind of, noti of uh, name, of intent. And then inside this uh, on receive, simply you process the notification that you have received. Uh, as far as I know, you can send, uh, if I remember well, four different types of notifications, and for one of them, you also have a payload of uh, 4,000 bytes inside the notification. So, you can simply send a notification that say something is happened, please, up something is happened, and then the application update itself, or you can also send a notification that say something is happened, and this is my payload. So, very short string that you can uh, use, for example, to, s to create a notification even without connecting to the in connect to even without uh, make a connection to the server to ask what's changed, for example, okay? So, also here, one, two, three, five line of code. Uh, the application, the chat application on the example, uh, basically implements this broadcast receiver that starts call a wakeful intent, uh, a wakeful uh, service, so a service that, that doesn't put uh, the device on hold until uh, the, process, uh, the process is finished. And this, uh, in this service basically process the notification. Okay, as I told you, there are different kind of notification and stuff like that. Once the, the, the notification has been processed, simply the service close itself, okay, put itself on hold. Remember, it's a network call, the registration of the device, the registration of the device for the notification. So, have, not to, have to be done in a sync way. It's totally bad that when your application starts, the first thing that the application does is to check and then register while the user is waiting with a black screen. Okay? Wrong. Totally wrong. So, remember to async all the registration part. 
Okay, oh, we still have plenty of time, so we can uh, go a little bit deeper inside the application architecture, okay? So, uh, this is a typical API, API call, okay? This call is uh, a network call, and so every network call, ta-da! have to be called in a separate thread than the UI thread. Okay, no way that you do this call inside, for example, the push of a button, stuff like that. You have to move everything uh, somewhere else and in another thread. Uh, the application implements a particular pattern. Uh, there is uh, an object, and then there is a call, uh, cloud uh, handler, should be the name, and this cloud handler basically calls uh, all the different uh, uh, RESTful APIs. So my application basically doesn't know about, doesn't know nothing about APIs or cloud endpoints or stuff like that. My application knows only about this object and then inside this object all the logic is managed. And uh, then there is a cloud callback handler that basically extends this object adding all the async logic. Okay, so we have an object that does all the dirty job, basically, and another object that simply adds async logic to this previous object. Okay? The question is, why this pattern is implemented? Ta-da! Another bonus if someone replied to the question. Yeah, you have to be async, no way, but w yeah, and this is the normal async flow. But why I have two different objects? I can simply create an object and put everything inside it, both the logic of the call and the async part to perform this call. Usability? What? Usability? Oh, uh, yeah, could be a good exam, a good, uh, a, a good reason. Some other better reason? Three, two, one. Ah, okay, this is the async part. Guys, testing, okay? If I have uh, an object that only performs calls, I can test it, and then have other tests to test the asynchronicity of uh, the wrapper object. In that way, I can perform good testing. Otherwise, I have to test uh, everything together. So I, if I inject mock, I cannot know very well how things are called, the async and stuff like that. So remember, there are a lot of different ways, but please uh, have a good code inside your app. And this is not the best example of, of good application, of good Android code you can have, but it's still a good example. By the way, you win because you was the nearest to the, <laughs> the solution, okay? So, another uh, thing inside the app is uh, how the activity lifecycle is managed, okay? Also in this case, uh, this is not the best way of doing stuff, also because you should know that uh, um, there are patterns, uh, there are best practices, but every context defines the best way, the reason that the one best way to do stuff, okay? So, uh, in this case, you know, the cloud backend, uh, the, where is it? Here, the cloud back, uh, the cloud, uh, this one, cloud callback be uh, manager, basically is, uh, you know, it's an object created when the application starts, so one time and all the, and, uh, all the components of the application refer to this only object. And so, uh, you know that uh, if you create this object inside an activity, when you rotate the screen, everything is destroyed, so if you lost this object, you have to recreate, and so the complexity of your activity uh, is uh, bigger. Using a fragment, like in that way, you can simply say, okay, when my activity is destroyed, this fragment is not destroyed. And you can put all the uh, instances or uh, variables or stuff like that inside this fragment. This is a super particular fragment because if you see from the code, is a fragment that has no interface. So basically it's a black fragment without interface used only for storing a couple of objects. 
Okay, when I set a set retain instance to true inside the fragment, the fragment is not destroyed if the activity is destroyed. And so, using that, I can simply say, okay, this is a brand new fragment. Okay, ask to the fragment manager if the, this fragment exists. If not, I create it, I set uh, something inside it, and I add this fragment to the transaction, uh, to the transaction manager. Then, if, when the activity is rotated, for example, this first line of code will retard my fragment so I have everything without the, the need to recreate objects and stuff like that, okay? And then, for example, the handler is called using a fragment getter, okay? Not directly. As I said, there are a ton of different ways of doing stuff like that. This is just one way. Then, okay, you realize that chat application is super nice, but you know, the backend is only for a chat application, and the reply is no. The backend basically manage uh, flexible kind of data, okay? Because the cloud entity, so the object that uh, is in the domain space of my application has a, has a, a, um, a property here that is a list, okay? So you can, if you want, just you can add another key and another value, another key and another value. Automatically, these, those properties are translated inside the entity DTO, so the object that is understood by my RESTful API, and so you have new data, the data that you have just added, also inside the backend. So, in this case, a simple chat application has a user and a message, maybe also a timestamp. Then you can add, for example, other properties, colors, or I don't know, whatever you want, just adding a new line when you create the cloud entity object, and everything is managed from you by the backend, without the need of uh, updating the backend, stuff like that, okay? And this is very useful because you can create a backend, have the push notification, authorization, authentication already in place, and simply adapt your application to this backend. Okay, without writing any single line of cloud code. Uh, okay, that's all. We still have 10 additional minutes, maybe even more. So uh, if you have a question, ask for your question. Otherwise, we can uh, go directly inside the code. I can also show you how to, for example, create the API and stuff like that. So, questions? Absolutely, yes. No, no, no. As I told you at the beginning, you can use these cloud endpoints with Android, iOS, and web. For web, you have the Google API library that you already use to call any Google API. You can simply substitute the address of the Google service with the address of your backend, and you're ready for the web. Okay, and for iOS, uh, I don't know the precise flow, but if you go, if you go to the uh, Cloud Endpoints documentation, there are also examples on how to create, uh, how basically to include the generated coded also in iOS. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. When you launch the command to generate the code, you have, you know, for Web API, no, because you already have the Google API library, but for Android iOS, a particular set of files are generated in order to, in, and then can be included inside your Android or, or iOS application. Yeah, you have different uh, tools. Uh, for example, you have free tire on App Engine. So if you use it uh, under some particular quota, you don't pay anything. So you can start experimenting, uh, do create your, the mock of your application, and you're okay. Then there is a uh, um, price calculator for, uh, for the Google Cloud Platform, and then you can add your, basically, data inside this price calculator, and you obtain an average uh, estimation of, your, uh, of the potential cost. But it's, it's still relied on how much it's actually used. It's not Obviously. 
Yes, the cloud, cloud platform doesn't have, I don't know, front, front uh, costs. So for example, you have to pay at the beginning of the month for what you will do during the month. No, end of month, billing on what you have consumed. Yes, totally. Uh, I don't remember, but if you go there, you, you see, if you go to the, to the cloud console, you see the free quota limits. And also depends, sorry, on the resource, because there is a quota for, I don't know, uh, CPU utilization or, um, I don't know, network operations, stuff like that. Okay. Yes, yes. So the question was, uh, if the push notification, the under push notification can be used by a third party service, service. Server, sorry, okay. Uh, absolutely yes, because uh, you have tons of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> proprietary servers that want to implement push notifications, so yes. You have to communicate, basically, the application on App Engine has all the required logic to communicate to the Google Cloud Messaging Server and uh, to communicate to, to this server and, to, and then so this server can update the client. So inside this project, you can see all the logic, but obviously you have documentation for whatever language you want. Here, yeah, okay. This may be long to answer. It's so free to find some external documentation. Okay. How does push notification work at a low level? How the message got routed? Uh, okay, we can discuss about later because it could be a little bit boring, but basically uh, there is different mechanism, different, uh, basically, uh, it depends. For example, there is a, an always open uh, channel between uh, the device and the Google services, an XMPP channel, because, you know, uh, email notification and stuff like that are uh, notified to the client. And so you can, uh, for example, if you, you can even implement your own push notification service, but so you need to create an open connection between your server and the device. With the Google Cloud Messaging, you basically reuse the same channel that is already open in the device. Okay, and that is already open in the device, and then uh, the server uh, will try to contact the device uh, as soon as you send the push notification, or after uh, some minutes if the device doesn't reply, stuff like that. So there is also a retrial mechanism that can assure that the notification is uh, sent to the device in a mm, feasible amount of time. Okay, but then uh, if you, I think that if you take a look to the official documentation, there are all the low-level steps, the under the hood steps uh, that are uh, basically that the server executes in order to send push notification to different devices. Uh, not the source code of the server, but the documentation how this, on how the server works. Okay. Okay, uh, before going to the code, because we have additional 10 minutes, uh, just a couple of stuff. If you want to be informed on what uh, Google is doing in Italy, okay, you can simply follow this blog. There is the blog, the plus page, so I will post regularly on the blog uh, all the initiatives, so for example, Code Emotion or other events that I'm organizing, stuff like that. If you want to uh, try the Google Cloud Platform, you can, and there is also a $500 of free credit that you can ask for uh, doing your stuff. And basically, basically go here, it's called the starter pack. Go here, put this code DA, and then you will receive in a couple of days uh, the, the, the $500 on your cloud project. Okay, so you can experiment without uh, the fear of, I don't know, maybe that I will pay thousands of euros. Generally, it doesn't happen because the prices are very, very low, but if you are scared, you have the security that <laughs> more than that you cannot pay. Okay? One, two, three. And finally, please rate my session because it's super important for me to know your opinion about my session, how it's uh, going and stuff like that. Okay? Uh, I will give you this uh, QR code at the end. So, very deeply... No, it's not a... Okay, 
this is Eclipse, and uh, basically you can use both Eclipse or uh, Android Studio or even the command line to run those stuff because, you know, cloud endpoints and all the other cloud, uh, Google Cloud Platform commands are suitable from uh, command line, Android Studio and Eclipse. No way. In Eclipse you should install a particular plugin and with this plugin you have a lot of new functionalities related to the Google Cloud Platform. In Android Studio everything is already included in command line, you know, it's the power of command line so <laughs> just install a command. Here I have, sorry, it's very, very, mm, I, I need another additional hand. Okay, here I have my backend project and my Android client, okay? And uh, then, yes, the support library, the standard way of include support library inside an Android application for Eclipse. So, uh, in the client, uh, you can download from GitHub, so feel free to download it. And, uh, okay, there is just one file that you, you need to update, const.java, and you set those values here. This is the name of my project, uh, the number, stuff like that. If you want, I can create a brand new project uh, just for you, just now, and I go to the cloud console. Okay, I'm here. I can create a new project call it uh, whatever I want, for example, uh, Code Emotion Rome 2014, and uh, here are my project ID. Alf chat Code Emotion. Okay? Once the project is created, you know, here, uh, okay. <laughs> now it's creating the activity, and uh, Okay, once done, uh, here it is. Okay, now you have a working cloud platform project, you can do whatever you want, or for example, start with the mobile backend starter. Okay, you click here, you click deploy, and automatically this code, this one, this part here, is deployed to your backend. Okay, so you can also download the code and start modifying it to add new features, stuff like that. But as I said to you before, if you want just to have a backend with uh, that stores for you some simple data format, you simply go with uh, what you already have. You don't need any additional modifications. And if you go to your project, okay, uh, the name of the project is that one. To access to my project, I Alfred Alf Chat Code Emotion appspot.com. You can obviously have your domain associated to this project, but this is the base of the project. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, still deploying the project, so it's hard that I can access to something that still doesn't exist on the cloud. No, okay, it's ready. And this is the configuration screen that uh, I showed you in the slide. So, for example, here it's... Uh, I can totally disable the access to the API. I can okay. I can open the API to the whole world, like in this case, and I also secure to by client ID and stuff like that. I can disable enable push notification. If I click on save, I can use here the Google API Explorer. Okay, here instead of mine, I can put another. Okay, my project name. And here it is. You have the explorer for the API that we have just created. Okay? It's loading. But by the way, this is the explorer that you can use to go through the API. If I go quickly go to the code, the server code, okay? Uh, as you can see here, I have different stuff, but. Okay, this is my entity DTO, the one that is understood by the API. And I have my...
OK. In this case, I defined a class and I put a notation on this class. OK? It's, this is the basic of cloud endpoints. You put a notation on the class and on the method that you want to, uh, to expose. Uh, you can also basically create a wrapper of your existing code and only put a notation on this wrapper. So if you change something in your backend code, basically you decouple the RESTful APIs from the code of your backend, okay? This is very, very easy to do. So you define the name of the API, you define, for example, the namespace and other parameters, and you also define uh, don't know, uh, the fact that in this case, uh, because I want to configure the API as public API or authorized only API, uh, here there is a particular syntax that basically delegates all this configuration to another class, but you can put uh, annotation directly here, and Every time that you want to create a new API, you can decore the method with this API method, specify the name of the method, if it has to be a get, a post, or other kind of call, then the path of the API, and here you basically can uh, you can say, okay, this parameter is a required parameter, and he has, to ha he has to have this name. So you can also have a different name for the variable inside your code and for the variable exposed in the RESTful API. Okay, once you have defined all this stuff for all the methods that you want to expose, you go here, here, Cloud Backend, Google, and generate cloud endpoint libraries. Basically, this uh, program executes some checks, modify your backend in order to create RESTful APIs, and generate the library code to include in your projects. Okay, so if I change something here, for example, uh, let me check. Uh, this method is called, uh, it's very bad to work with this huge resolution here. Um, okay, let's go. Let's see what we have. Oh, it's still loading. Mm -hmm. Okay. My API, mobile backend API version 1. If I want to add or change a version, I can go here. And okay, there is no there is no point here, but you can add, for example, a version attribute directly here in the class annotation, and so you can generate a new class with new API and all the logic that you want. And uh, when you simply uh, create the cloud here with the command, generate the cloud endpoint client library and redeploy your application in the, your app engine application in the cloud, you obtain new updated API in your project, okay? So it's very, very easy to, to use. Uh, on Android Studio, I don't think I have the time to show you how to do this in Android Studio, but it, it's even uh, easier, very, very easy, because you have a wizard that allows you to create uh, whatever you want. So. Question on that? Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you. This is the feedback form. Please compile it. And uh, don't forget to, to follow the next session about uh, gender gap, BigQuery, Wikipedia, and how to use BigQuery, uh, uh, the BigQuery, and how to use BigQuery from my colleague Philippe here and Eva that I don't know where she is. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys and uh, please rate the session.